Hello, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the latest in our series of BSI monthly built environment webinars. Hope everybody is well. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for what we hope is a really informative session today. So uh, my name is Ian Richardson. I'm one of the sector leads at BSI. Um, today I'll be joined by two of my colleagues, Cara and Simon, that I'll introduce shortly. Uh, just before we get into the main body of our webinar this afternoon, as you can imagine, if you're used to these types of events, there is a little bit of housekeeping that we shall run through briefly before we get going. So as usual, this is a listen only webinar, uh, but we are recording uh, the, the content for you to watch back on demand later or share with your colleagues. Of course, as always, we welcome your questions via the Q&A function, which hopefully you can see in your panels. Uh, please feel free to write any questions into that and we shall look at those too. At the end of our, our main content, we then, we're then we looking to hold a, a short Q&A session at the conclusion of the presentation. So please, um, as I say, click on, click on the panel and post your questions. If there are any difficulties, please again, submit this issue via the Q&A function if you're able and we will look into trying to correct those issues during the, during the session itself. And then upon completion of a feedback survey that you will be sent, we'll send you through the link to the recording of the webinar in due course. So um, some of you may have joined um, our monthly webinars before, and this one follows on from one of our, our previous editions earlier in the year, where we looked at BSI's Built Environment Sector Team Focus for 2023. And, and our priorities. And today we'll be looking to cover the topic of BSI standards development processes and committee structures. Um, just as a sort of overview of what's, what's, uh, what's happening in the industry at the moment, we're experiencing a time, I think, when there are significant challenges facing the industry. We could look at things such as the drive to net zero and energy efficiency, digital transformation continues, the arrival of the Building Safety Act, as well as new construction products regulation, to name but a few. The content of today's webinar will, um, I hope, give a really good foundation for how the standards and supporting products that BSI produces in our role as national standards body for the UK are attempting to meet and solve these types of challenges. And of course, we work very closely with all of our stakeholders and the expertise represented on our committees to help us to deliver that. So without further ado, I will go into um, I will go into introducing Simon Hamlet and Cara Ebanks, our senior standards managers for the built environment and fire sectors. And guys, um, I shall turn my camera off now and hand over to you. And of course, we'll have cameras back on when we arrive back later on at the Q and A session. Thank you very much, and over to you. Thanks very much, Ian. So uh, yes, I'm Cara Ebanks, um, and then I'll hand over to Simon uh, shortly. So I'll take you through the first few few slides. So the agenda today, um, I'll not read all of this out, but um, today Simon and I are gonna talk you through a bit of BSI history, just briefly, uh, why standards are important, um, how they're developed, and, and also importantly, how anyone who's interested can, can get involved. So that's that's what we're going to cover today. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, what is BSI? So BSI um, is essentially what we would call a, a business standards company. Um, and our main aim is to help organizations, you may have known the tagline, uh, make excellence a habit so they can perform better, reduce risk and grow sustainably. So it's to, to help all organizations within the UK and then by relation globally as well. So few statistics that uh, for you, you know, 84,000 clients in over 93 countries worldwide from globally recognized brands to much smaller companies as well. So right across the spectrum, uh, BSI has a memorandum of understanding in place um, with the British government and we are therefore established as the UK's national standards body. We're also a Royal Charter company so that means we reinvest all of our profits back into the business and are extremely customer focused so rather than shareholder focused 
everything goes back into the business and what it is we do and, and developing those, those all important standards. Uh, we are a global certification business as well. So although Simon and I work within the knowledge side, the publishing side, um, we have a certification and, uh, you know, and through that, through the kite mark business uh, as well. So you may have seen the little kite mark symbol on manhole covers or, or the glass in your in your car or something like that. And that that is BSI. Um, and uh, we are also uh, a member of all of the uh, icons that you see at the bottom. So we're a member of ISO, CEN, CENELEC which is the Electrotechnical, IEC, International Electrotechnical, and Etsy as well. So we're, we're a member of all of those organizations. And as a result, that means that we have to operate in a certain way and to a certain uh, uh, governance, which we'll talk through later on. So next slide, please. So a little history um, of, of standards itself. So standards, they are ubiquitous. They're everywhere in our lives. So if you think, for example, your debit card or your credit card, you know, the reason that you can put this into any cash point or pay, pay machine anywhere in the world is because of standards. Um, so, you know, they, they really do cover a broad, a broad spectrum, uh, some little icons at the bottom there. BSI was formed in 1901, uh, Sir John Wolfe by Sir John Wolfe Barry, the man who designed uh, London's Tower Bridge. And uh, BSI was the world's first national standards body. And the original BSI committee, we now have lots of them, but the original one was set up for the first time on uh, the day Queen Victoria died, uh, on 22nd of January 1901. And the first standards, one of the first ones it went on to publish, related to steel sections for tramways. And we still, we still publish steel, steel um, standards today. Uh, the BSI kite mark uh, was first registered in June 1903. Um, and take us back, that's the same year which uh, Harley Davidson, Crayola Crayons and the Tour de France were born as well, so uh, pretty old. Um, and we were originally known as the British Standard Mark, but it's grown into one of uh, Britain's most important and most recognised consumer quality marks uh, as well, through the Kite Mark and through the BSI logo itself. Um, You'll also see pictures of uh, standardised shipping containers, um, and when looking at those pictures of the ship, uh, trapped in the Suez Canal recently. They're shaped uniformly for ease of transport and movement. And this really revolutionized world trade in the 1950s. So if you know what you're going to be able to, to get on a ship and how much more effective it is to calculate the costs and weights and movement of goods across the world. So where sta uh, standards started? Uh, generally with product standards. Um, and we've moved on to encompass uh, standards for systems and processes such as you know, our, one of our best uh, and most well-known standards on quality management, ISO 9001. Um, and now we've moved on to, um, to, to it helped develop innovation in, in other industries and areas such as how our own laptops work, what we're all using now, the interoperability required for the internet of things to exist um, and ultimately work effectively. So we'll come back and refer to other examples um, later on, but um, the same principle applies across a wide variety of areas. Um, you know, it, it, in essence, it means industry coming together and agreeing best practice. And this ranges from the ultra, ultra mundane to make a cup of tea, there are standards on tea, to newer things, you know, driverless cars, connected and autonomous vehicles, and the work we're doing right across the automotive industry to inform security, the latest in artificial intelligence, um, as well as things like smart cities, um, you know, building information modeling, which is revolutionizing the built environment. Um, moving on to ultra contemporary and future orientated things. Um, so BSI is at the forefront of all of these businesses and societal, societal topics and, and, and others as well. So standards are enablers of trade and enterprise. They impact on almost all aspects of our lives and help to make things work and improve the way that organizations do things. Next slide, please. So what are standards? Um, standards, as it says at the top, are an agreed way of doing things. Uh, Simon is going to discuss our definition of consensus and specifically how standards are developed shortly. But what do standards do? Well, they make they do all of the things on, on listed on the right hand side on those icons with the overarching wisdom of what does good look like? Um, 
standards are sometimes also referenced in regulations or alternatives to, or are used as an alternative to regulation as well. So uh, contrary to, to some thinking, um, standards are not law, uh, but where they are referenced, um, it, it, can, it, can, it can be often misinterpreted in that way. So they're referenced in regulation, often used as an, as an alternative to them. Next slide, please. So this slide here just gives another brief um, and visual uh, viewpoint on, on where standards are. You know, when I say they're bit ubiquitous and they're everywhere, it really is that, that uh, that's the case. So how far do they reach? You know, from a built environment perspective, they're, they're the pavement that you walked on when you, you know, you go down the street, uh, the doorway that you walk through uh, or the lock on your front door and how secure it is. We have standards on that um, and, uh, you know, you, testing testing for those for those as well and throwing hammers at them and to see how strong they are so standards from a built environment perspective are absolutely everywhere and they're all around so it, it, to essentially improve outcomes for consumers and and, and minimize harm as it says at, at, at the top of that slide there next slide please so this is essentially what does standards look like uh, on the far left we've got uh, bsen iso so that's 9001 We've got uh, next one of our more uh, newer products, uh, a Flex um, 5500 on face, uh, 5555 on face coverings. We've got a, uh, a British standard, just a typical British standard with track changes. So that's highlighting the parts that have been updated recently. And then uh, one of our other standards products on, on PASIS as well. So uh, the, the, Within standards, there are prescriptive, uh, normative references and non-prescriptive, more informative references as well. So a normative reference is a characteristic of, of material in a standard that's essential to the application of the standard in, in the manner that it's intended and against which it's possible to demonstrate and claim conformity to that standard. An informative standard uh, is a characteristic of material in a standard that supplements normative material by offering advice, information, or guidance. Um, so, so two quite distinctive references within, within standards there. Types of standards we publish, uh, specifications, uh, which is a document specifying performance um, and design, production, service requirements. There's a code of practice. Uh, which have normative recommendations, informative guidance on good practice. There's a method, a documenting, uh, document giving detail or instructions for carrying out procedures for measurement or testing, for example, as I mentioned with your, your door locks that we all have at home. There's a vocabulary, which is a reference document defining terms used in a particular sector or technology. There's a guide, uh, similar to a British standard code of practice, but it's generally more informative in, in nature. And then a published document, so a non-standard publication, which just gives guidance and recommendations in a way similar to a guide or a code of practice. Um, so uh, all of this means that the content of a standard will either be written in a way that compliance can only be reached by meeting all the requirements laid down by the standard, as in with 9001, or it can be written in a in more informal way, where the text is designed to give some idea about how to go about doing things. Um, okay. So uh, next slide, please, and I'll hand you over to Simon. Thank you, Carla. BSI develops around two and a half thousand standards every year um, across all of our sectors. Uh, that includes amendments, minor edits and things like that. And uh, we also withdraw close to the same amount. That's because we have a review process that's continuous. Standards are living tools, they're practical, real world solutions. And they're written by experts in their field because they have the best view of what best practice looks like. There are around 13,000 um, active members of our technical committees and subcommittees, of which there are roughly 1,200. Um, and they are uh, nominated by around 2,700 nominating bodies. Um, they're very important because members of BSI committees don't just sit there as individuals, uh, they represent stakeholder groups, whether that's a, a trade association, a professional body, consumers, the government, others like that. Anyone with an interest in the standard is represented on that committee. So, 
BSI's role is to, to facilitate, to bring together those experts to develop standards. Those committees can develop either national standards, British standards, or they can contribute to standards at the European or international level. And I'll come on to those different levels in a minute. So either um, the national committee develops the standard itself or it nominates delegates to European and international committees. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, please, I will tell you a bit more about those different um, types of standard. So at the bottom of that pyramid in blue or green, however it appears on your screen, um, we have a, a selection of different private standards and, and similar. And they're not the subject of today's presentation. They are um, drawn up with BSI's help for individual companies or organizations, um, but not circulated more widely. So unless you're part of one of those organizations, you, you won't come across them. Um, the ones at the top in red um, are what we are talking about today. Um, so if we start at the bottom, um, then sponsored standards such as the, the, the PAS or the FLEX um, are developed with sponsorship from commercial organisations, but using um, the same process as all British standards, um, including um, stakeholder consultation. Um, but they tend to be developed quite quickly um, compared to, to British or international standards and are often used in areas where um, the, the technology is relatively new um, or is, is fast moving. So a flex, for example, goes through a number of iterations over a period of months. And as technology develops, the standard can change to keep up. Now, what I should have actually mentioned before I started talking about this is that the, um, those bands on the pyramid, um, the length relates to um, the, the breadth of um, stakeholder involvement and the audience or users of the standard once it's been published. So sponsored standards um, have a, um, a smaller range of, of consultants, whereas if you go up to the next level, the national standards, British standards, um, they are you know, consulted on more widely. They have a, a wider range of stakeholders involved in their development. Um, they are for a UK audience because we are the national standards body. If you go up to the next level, regional standards, which of course for us means European because we're in Europe, um, then they involve all of the uh, national standards bodies from 34 European countries, um, all of whom are members of SEN and SENELEC. And as Cara mentioned, the European Standards Development Organizations for standards and for electrotechnical standards. It's important to note that these are, are not um, EU bodies. Um, as I said, there are, are 34 members of SEN and SEMELEC, so that's seven more um, than there are members of the EU. Although they do work um, with the European Commission on some things, they are separate, uh, and BSI remem remains a member of both. And then at the top, um, international standards developed by ISO and IEC, the international counterparts to SEN and SENELEC, and there are um, 168 members of ISO and a slightly smaller number for the IEC. So standards um, developed there have a global reach and global involvement in their development. And as I alluded to, the way it works is that um, UK committees nominate delegates uh, to those European committees and those international committees to put forward the UK view. May we have the next slide, please? So how are standards made? Well, the starting point um, is an idea, of course, and an important point to note is that anybody can have that idea uh, and anybody can propose a standard. Now, in practice, a lot of proposals do come from our technical committees and subcommittees, um, but they are not limited to that. Um, anyone um, is able to go to our standards development portal, and there'll be a link to that further on in the, the slide deck, um, and make that proposal. All proposals 
are considered by the relevant technical or subcommittee. They may not decide to go ahead with them. For example, they may identify that the proposal um, conflicts with a standard that already exists, that is, that it would duplicate one. Um, there may be other reasons. Um, so not all ideas will necessarily get forward, but they are all considered. Once a committee has decided um, that there is a need for that standard, um, then in collaboration with the BSI committee manager, a business case will be developed um, to go forward to our planning and approval process, which is, as the name suggests, um, decides which standards are actually developed. And before something goes into planning and approval, the proposal is put onto the standards development portal, which again enables anyone to comment. Um, the idea is to uh, seek feedback on whether stakeholders in the, the relevant area think a standard is a good idea or a bad idea, and that will be taken into account in planning and approval. If the business case is a good one and it gets approved, um, usually on the basis that there is a user need for that standard, um, also it may address things like, like safety, for example, um, then approval is given for the project to go ahead and it moves on to the next stage. Now this is where all those 13,000 committee members come in, um, all of whom are volunteers by the way. Um, the committee is responsible for drafting that standard. It is not written by BSI staff, it is written by those technical experts who are formed into a, a drafting panel as we call it, um, which is is appointed by the technical committee or the subcommittee to actually do the work of writing the standard. Once they've done that, the draft is um, put back on the standards development portal um, as what we call a, a DPC, a draft for public comment. And it's there for two months, and that's another opportunity for anyone um, to make comments on it. Once those two months have concluded, um, the committee then, so the drafting panel then considers all of those comments. And it's very important to note that every single comment is considered. They go through them very methodically and address every single one. It may not be that they don't accept every comment, but everyone will be looked at and discussed and considered. So please be assured that it is very much worth your while making the comment because it will be looked at. Once those comments have been considered and any changes made um, to the draft as a result, it will then be sent back to the, the technical committee or the, the subcommittee for their approval to publish it. And once they've approved it, um, it becomes a published standard. Every five years, at the very most, standards are reviewed. It's what we call a, a systematic review to make sure that they are still current. However, that's the maximum length, because at any point, anyone can say this standard um, needs to be revised. Again, in practice, it is often the, the committee that does so, um, but it's entirely open for anyone, again, to go to the standards development and portal and say this standard is now out of date because of whatever it might be and the committee will consider that. Again they may not immediately accept that reason for changing it, it may well be for example that um, a change suggested isn't urgent and it makes sense to wait and gather together a number of suggestions for amendments so that instead of producing a new one every year which may not be appreciated by users they are collected together and a, um, a consolidated update um, make, is made after a couple of years. It will all depend um, on the nature of the proposal. If it relates to safety, for example, then it may happen much more quickly because obviously it's essential that unsafe situations are correct, corrected as soon as possible. Uh, next if, I might just, um, if I might just interject at this point, Simon, just to say just to say that um this process is by and large the same process whether you were developing a british standard an iso 
an EN or whatever. There are slight nuances in it, but this process is essentially the same. And the draft, the time for um, a draft for public comment DPC is 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 the same as well. The exception out of this uh, process is a, a BSI flex, which m works on a much uh, speedier, much quicker timeline. Uh, you're drafting for a couple of weeks and then you release something um, as opposed to sort of formally publish something, uh, release it to the general public as, as a document um, to be used and commented on as well at the same time, so simultaneously. Whereas with this process, it's much more formal, much more rigorous to ensure that there is a consensus driven approach and a formal standard at the end of it. The, the flex process is intended for newer areas where um, something just needs to be needs to be um, given out to the marketplace for the, the world then to comment on, and then it comes back into another iteration and then released in the same manner again, um, with the view that in the end uh, there is a solid document that moves on to within this process a more formal ISO or, or British standard. So, no matter what, which uh, standards or organisation, um, as I say, you're. Uh, uh, SEN or ISO or, or whoever, this process is generally followed. And it is a very similar process used globally for other national standards bodies as well. Um, so it, this, this is the, the, the key to, to the development process. Sorry, Simon, thank you. No, not at all. That's a, a very good point, which I should have made myself. Um, yes, it is the same process, regardless. There are just some sort of slightly different terminologies used, for example, at, at European and international level, they have working groups rather than drafting panels, but they, they do the same thing. And they refer to inquiry rather than draft for public comment. But again, it is the same thing. Um, thank you. Next slide, please. Um, as Cara mentioned, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about consensus, um, which is absolutely key uh, to how we work. Um, you will see there on the screen the ISO IEC definition of consensus, which is also used by BSI, um, which is that it is um, general agreement um, and it is characterized by the absence of sustained opposition. So as the note says, it does not necessarily imply unanimity. Um, it's not a, um, a vote system either. Um, it is general agreement. And that's very important because standards are, are voluntary. Um, we want everyone to be um, happy with the outcome and to feel comfortable using the standard, um, to feel that they can use them no matter what part of, of the sector they come from. And obviously different, um, different parts will have different interests, but bringing them all together and finding that common ground, that meeting point where they are all, broadly speaking, happy with what the standard says um, is a good basis on which to do that. and one. Um, on which we can move forward with a standard. So, as I said, maybe that one or two stakeholders think it's not exactly the way they would have preferred to have, have done something, but they're happy to say, okay, this isn't what I would have done, but I can see that there is general agreement elsewhere. It doesn't um, go against anything I wish to do. So therefore I'm happy to say, right, I won't object to that. Uh, and therefore it can move forward to the next stage. It's, it's very important to get everyone to, to come together to that, that middle ground, um, particularly in, in this voluntary situation where standards aren't regulation, they're not legislation. People have to, to want to use them um, for them to, to be effective. Uh, next slide, please. So committees are made up of um, a variety of different stakeholder groups um, the development of a standard is a, a collective endeavor um, and so it needs to involve a, a wide range of interests and we, we welcome applications for membership from any interested party um, what you'll see on the screen is um, a selection of those stakeholder groups that may well be involved in a, a committee but it isn't just limited to those, or it may be that in some areas, not all of those will be represented if they're not all relevant. Um, the important thing is that a, a committee contains the appropriate technical expertise, uh, that it fairly represents the range of interests affected by its standards, including users, um, and that it is diverse and inclusive. Uh, you will see that 
two of the circles there are in a, a different color to the rest of them. Um, there is a reason for that. Um, but if we may go on to the next slide, please, um, I shall tell you a little bit more about why they're different. Um, so, committee members, um, as you'll see, it's expected that committee members will have um, technical expertise or knowledge relevant uh, to the areas of the committee's work. And also, as I mentioned earlier, um, that they represent a collective body, that's a, a nominating organisation that has a legitimate interest in the work of that committee. So, as I said, that may be a trade association, a professional body, a regulator, national devolved government, charities, etc. But they, the idea is that they represent a constituency. It's not just one person's view. Um, it is the, the view of a whole group of stakeholders, the wider the better. And they should really receive a, a brief from that, um, that group before coming to a committee meeting so that they can give the considered view of the, the widest number of, of stakeholders possible. But very occasionally there might be individual co-opted experts who do who, who are appointed to the committee because it needs some specialist expertise um, but they're the exception rather than the norm the committee is chaired by a, a committee chair um, one of those people in the, the gray circles um, and they have to be neutral um, it is their job to seek the consensus that i mentioned previously um, and to to chair meetings of the committee to achieve that consensus therefore they can't be representing a particular point of view um, they need to be balanced and neutral now in practice most committee chairs tend to be former members of the committee because they have the, the knowledge and the skills required but they don't have to be um, all committee roles are advertised openly anyone can apply and Anyone who can demonstrate the required um, skills and knowledge is eligible, eligible for appointment. Um, chairs serve a term of three years, and that can be renewed once, so it's a maximum of six years as chair. Uh, the other person who needs to be neutral is the committee manager, uh, and they are a member of BSI staff. Um, and Cara and I have a team, each of eight or nine of them, and who each manage a portfolio of committees. So they, along with the chair, will help um, set the agenda, they'll take the minutes, um, they'll manage the committee, and they'll manage the development of standards. Um, although I think it's important to note they're not just there to do minutes and agendas, they do have a, a management role in ensuring that those standards are developed. Um, committee managers are BSI staff, committee chairs and members are as I mentioned earlier, volunteers, and we're very grateful for all the time and effort that they put into developing standards. One body I should mention is uh, CPIN, the Consumer and Public Interest Network. Um, they train and support representatives of the consumers and the public interest. So they don't necessarily fit into a, an obvious stakeholder group like a trade association or a professional body. Um, but it's important that their, their um, interests are represented because they are the people who are perhaps most affected um, by a standard, even if they are not themselves users of it. Um, there are some links there to our governance documents. There are a number that apply um, to how committees work, the most important being uh, BS0, standard for standards, and that guides everything that we do. Um, there is also a, a committee member policy, for example. We provide training courses for our committee members and for um, the chairs. And again, you'll see a link there, um, which will give you a, um, an idea of the wide range of courses that we do offer. Next slide, please. And at that point, I'll hand back to Cara. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so just quickly to run through some of the standards that we've recently published um, and then some standards in development. So we'll pop some links on a, on a slide at the end, uh, which you can all use uh, links to our standards development portal, which um, is slightly misnamed in that it, it is a list of everything that's in development and everything that has published and all of the committees relating to those standards as well. So if ever you're wondering 
um, how to to um, to comment on a standard or what is is being reviewed at the moment or to get if you're interested in it then then that's the link uh, on there as well so we'll, we'll we'll talk about that later but to pull a couple out and specifically related to built environment this is a list of, of um, titles that have recently published um, and also I'll go, go on to the development. So uh, 99001, uh, heavily related to our, our, our uh, well-known ISO 9001 uh, quality management standard that, that builds on uh, 9001. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a, key, a key document for the sector with relation to uh, competence, design quality, temporary works, um, documented information and all of those areas as well. So a really key standard that published uh, toward the end of last year. Um, 8644, BS 8644 part one, uh, digital management and fire safety. So fire safety information and fire safety in general is, is incredibly important um, at the moment. So this is a brand new standard and supports the, the golden thread of information about buildings, which is a key recommendation from uh, Dame Judith Hackett's independent review of building regs and fire safety following the, um, the Grenfell Tower fire uh, five, six years ago. So that's an important one as well um, and then 8629 as well uh, recently been revised on um, uh, evacuation alert systems as well so that's been revised um, those who are in the know uh, another 19650 relating to bim building information modeling and this one part four relates to information exchange um, and then there'll be more there's more obviously published as well uh, on the uh, 19650 suite and then more to follow and I think the the first ones part two uh, one two actually are, are due for a revision um, in in the next uh, next 12 months or so as well so they'll be going into their second version and then the euro codes as well anyone who is uh, has any uh, interest in euro codes will know that uh, the euro codes are around about over 200 standards publishing across the next five year period and then around about 90 or so national um, annex documents which are alongside that so some of which are, have been released the euro codes um, have been released and then the annexes will be coming through this year and then over the next five years as well so look out for, for anything relating to euro codes uh, coming through the pipeline if that's of interest the next standard please uh, next standard next uh, slide please uh, so these are the standards that are in development uh here which are a number of them that we've got um again talking about fire all important fire at the top 5839 part 8 um, on alarm systems so this is a revision of a, a well-established and widely used standard for fire alarms that uh, use a voice announcement rather than a tone which can be interesting uh which can be uh, much more uh, according to testing much more useful um, on some some uh, occasions rather than a than a beeping noise and then uh, 9991 is uh, that, that uh, well-known suite, um, but that one specifically, 9991, uh, is also being really uh, re reviewed as well. Um, and uh, it's the first time that this standard has been updated since Grenfell Tower 2. Concrete, um, which, and the, the important part of this one, uh, this is a revision of a, of a key standard on the specifications of concrete. Um, and specifically the revision includes the, um, to enable the use of lower carbon ingredients that support more sustainable construction. So parts one and two on that coming through. Um, on competency, which is um, another um, a recommendation from uh, Dame Judith Hackett's report. Um, so BS 8670. As I mentioned, the FLEX standard previously, this was born out of out of a FLEX standard, so it's now um, in development as a, as a British standard under the new committee of CPB1 on competency in the built environment. So that's uh, that's another important one coming through. I've mentioned Euro codes already um, that uh, that's in development, and um, and as I mentioned as well, BIM as well, the uh, 19650 Part Six on health and safety that's currently in development too. Next slide, please. So what's next? These are just some areas um, that generally across BSI, um, Simon mentioned that we've got, uh, we, we hold a sort of team of nine or 10 each. There are around about 70 or so standards development managers or committee managers within BSI managing all of these areas and more. Um, so alongside looking at all of these particular areas, they're currently, as Simon has said, revising, continually revising the 30 odd thousand standards that are already published. 
um, and then around about the uh, the 12 or so hundred committees that that we manage um, specifically. So um, there's a, there's an awful lot going on in these areas, and if anyone is interested in having more information, then please do please do get in touch. We'd be um, more than welcome. Or as I say, go onto the standards development portal to uh, to have a look in those particular areas. You just pop in the search box a particular area, and you'll get a whole load of committees and a whole load of standards that are published and in in um, in development. Next slide, please. So uh, relating to the London Declaration, there's a lot of words on here, um, so feel free to, to, to read them uh, now or, or, or later on in your own time. But um, there was a significant moment um, in the global race towards net zero, uh, and that's taken place in signing uh, the London Declaration. And this is the development of the Declaration. It was led by BSI with the intention of embedding sustainability in all standards and standards processes. So it moves, uh, it commits all ISO members, of which obviously BSI is one, members and stakeholders and partners uh, to accelerating the achievement of the goals laid out in the Paris Agreement, which include reaching net zero by 2050 and keeping the rising mean global temperature well below two degrees or ideally uh, below one and a half degrees. So this is, this is a really uh, important part of of um, of what we are doing within BSI and the processes that we are uh, continuing to develop and embedding these processes and revised processes is in everything that we do with relation to the final document of standardization and also its development. So uh, although this is relating very much to ISO's commitment um, and our member membership of ISO, we've extended um, this and uh, we intend to um, implement it on both international and national portfolios, um, and there'll be an action plan uh, to deliver both, uh, both, both of those particular areas. So everything we're doing um, relate, relates to that, um, including, as Simon said, in the process of, of um, approval um, of any new particular area in standardization and new standards idea, it's being considered in that process. So uh, the, the consideration is now uh, within there to uh, consider extreme weather events and greenhouse gas emissions. So that's something that all of our standards development managers and committee managers have to note when, when putting through a new proposal for a new or revised standard. Next slide, please. So I'll hand you back to Simon to just uh, finish off. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as we both mentioned throughout, I think the, one of the key things about standards development is that we want as many people as possible to be involved. Um, anyone can apply to be um, a member of a committee or a chair, um, and you'll see there there's a, a link to the application form, um, which we'll, you'll be able to click on when you get sent slides later on. Um, as I also said, it's should generally be the case that um, committee members should represent uh, a nominating body, um, but there's a wide range of bodies that, um, that can nominate people. Um, we don't limit it. Any, any group of stakeholders that has a legitimate interest in the development of a standard can and indeed should be represented on that committee. Um, so if you'd like to be involved, please do apply. Um, we appreciate that not everybody has the, the time to be on a committee, um, but if you don't have the time to do that, you may well still be able to comment on draft standards. So again, through the standards development portal, which I've mentioned a number of times because it's very important to what we do, um, anyone um, can comment on a standard and their, can, their comments will be considered by the drafting panel. Um, please do follow the link when you get it. Um, what you will find is once you've logged in, you are able to um, to follow standards and committees. So if you just click on the one you're interested in, it should then tell you um, when it reaches the next stage. So for example, if something is a proposal, um, you should then get a notification later on when it becomes a draft for public comment, and you can go in and you can add your comments to it. Um, with that, uh, we come to the end of the presentation itself. So if we can go to the next slide, please, and I'll hand back to Ian. Thank you both. Excellent. An enormous amount to cover, and I think you did it impeccably. So thank you for doing that. Um, 
just before we start to perhaps look at some questions, and I can see you're turning your cameras on there to see your beautiful faces. Thank you so much. Not so much for mine, unfortunately. But um, yes, just a couple of thoughts, just a couple of thoughts for me on what you've said. So, you know, Simon, you finished there on, on sort of the, the access to our drafts and our products generally. I think it's worth noting that um, the, the platform for which you can access copies of our standards that is now named the knowledge platform, BSI knowledge platform. So that's where you can you can download and, and purchase our, our standards. And I think we use the word knowledge, as you can imagine, deliberately, because I think this is not a case of us just just producing standards, publishing them, and, and then moving on and, and, and trying to almost let the marketplace deal with it themselves. It's actually a, a case that we back this up with supporting material and trying to help out with, with sort of clarifying as we have done today. But there's lots of material on there. And even when we talk about the different types of standards that you both mentioned throughout um, and, and the different needs and uses of them, Cara, you touched on flexes and passes and, and the speed to market that they now allow us, largely driven by that face coverings uh, flex that you mentioned, because of course, there were no standards for that and the pandemic drove that much faster standards development model which is brilliant and we're using that more and more these days but i think you know an example around sort of pas 9980 and the fact that actually that's the the fire risk appraisal uh, pas uh, for, for cladding that was published last year too I, I think that's that's a really important one and that can be downloaded for free off that knowledge platform. So I think that again, in terms of accessibility, we talk a lot about the price of standards and perhaps sometimes understandably it's seen as a barrier. I think there are ways in which that can be tackled too. But thankfully, we've had some questions, which is great. So with a few minutes left, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull a few of these out, which I hope one or both of you can can help to answer. Um, the first one here, perhaps Cara, because we talked about the, the standardization process and BSI's membership of all those many bodies, that's been that's been picked up. So the question is around, could you explain more about the standardization process in terms of the different groups involved within the elaboration of standards? So they mentioned ISO, IC, um, Sensemic here and provide perhaps some insight regarding national standards and European standards, international standards, perhaps relating to when and how each would be developed. Cara, if you could help us with that one, that would be great. I'll try, yes. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I've mentioned uh, other standards organizations, and most countries across the world, <clears throat> excuse me, have uh, a, a national standards body, um, and each of those countries will be developing their own standards. Um, so th there is that, and then they come together in those groups at CEN or CENELEC and ISO or IEC um, to, to, to essentially get a broader audience and a broader adoption of, of, those, of those particular standards. And quite often um, a base document from a national standards body, from us or whoever, will be the basis of that, that EN or, or, or that ISO. Um, uh, in terms of CEN and ISO, as part of our membership, um, because we're a member of CEN, we have to adopt every single um, standard that, that comes through on that, and then as a result, withdraw anything that conflicts as well. That's, that's part of our membership, irrespective of Brexit, irrespective of the European Commission or whoever, as our members, as a member of CEN, that's what every single organisation has to do. That is the intention with ISO as well, although it is not absolute. So we adopt most, 99% of what comes out of ISO, but sometimes we don't adopt everything that comes out of ISO, which is why, for example, 9001 has BS, EN, ISO, because it's adopted by all of those different organisations. Um, and uh, it's worth noting as well that, that most of what, what BSI publishes is European and international as well. Um, the exception actually is, interestingly, built environment, where many uh, and most of the national work is done within the built environment. So most of the British standards that BSI publishes come from built environment. Nevertheless, you know, across the board, across the group, uh, most of what we publish uh, are, are ENs or, or ISOs. And we do have a policy, if you remember um, the triangle, that the inverted triangle that, that Simon took us through, um, our policy is, is to publish international first. So it could be that an idea, whether it's face coverings or connected and automated vehicles, um, starts off as a flex or a PAS, 
um, it can then skip steps and go straight up to ISO as we saw with BIM, so the 8650 and then moved on to 19650 as well. So, um, the, but we do have a policy to publish international first. So as we've talked about, many standards organizations have their own way of doing things, but it often is very similar to the process. Um, and most countries do have national standards bodies and where they don't, we actually have a department that, that, that goes out and teaches them, you know, and shows them what it is that we do and does a similar presentation to what we're doing here. So to try and, and get that, that NSB within that particular country. So I hope that answers that. Yeah, great. Lots of things I hadn't thought of. So yeah, thank you for that answer. And it does remind me, of course, that, you know, the, the global product of, a, of ISO or IEC is, of course, supposed to allow uh, organisations to, to operate cross borders with that, that sort of best practice and, and model in there. And I, I recall even back in my days of, uh, of developing standards with committees that you would have uh, as part of an international committee meeting, you would have delegations from all over the world. I recall one meeting where the, the Japanese delegation uh, was sat trying to translate because obviously all standards are written in English. What they wanted to make sure was that the language that was put in the draft was translatable. So when mm. we talk about language and a common language, you know, we had to make sure there weren't words in there that the, 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 the Japanese language couldn't cope with. So, you know, we talk about timescales for standards development, you know, all those different languages across the world also have to be taken into account of those those consultative phases that I think Simon was explained to. So thank you for that answer. Brilliant. So I've got another one here. Yeah, and I think as well that that, you know, if you've got it, people often say, why does it take so long to publish a British standard for an ISO? Well, you're dealing with from a global perspective, all of the different opinions, which then need to be consulted with the national standards body. And then, like you say, the, the language barrier is, is another factor yeah. in amongst that. And overarching, yeah. we're dealing with volunteers. You know, most of the time within within the uh, BSI, most of these, these people are very, um, sort of, uh, very valuable to BSI volunteers who, who uh, dedicate their own time to it. So, you know, Christmas days I've, <laughs> I've heard of as well. So, um it's uh we're incredibly thankful but this is the reason why it takes so long um most yeah, of the time sure thank you the second one i've got here that i think is interesting perhaps simon um we could come to you on this one so again some questions about specification of products understandably with the built environment how that might be addressed by standardization perhaps quite a topical question driven by what's happened in the last week with finally releasing the independent review of the construction product testing re regime, the Paul Morrell and Lee Day report. So what, do you, what, what would your thoughts be on the relationship there with standards? Well, yes, clearly um, product standards can help um, specifiers to ensure that the, the construction products they use um, are you know, perform as expected, that they are safe. Um, obviously, uh, um, any um, any building, any infrastructure is a, a collection of components of products um, and it, it, we've seen sadly in, in recent years what, what can happen when components don't perform as expected. Um, you mentioned the, 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 the independent report into construction product testing by um, Paul Morrell who is a, a construction expert and Anne Lee's Day who is a, uh, a King's Councillor. I'm still getting used to not saying QC, yeah. it still sounds yeah. odd but um, a very experienced barrister um, who spent a long time um, looking into how construction products are, are tested. Um, they released their report last week, it's very recent, and so we are still um, you know, reading and digesting. And we will, of course, you know, respond appropriately once we've, we've had a chance to look at it properly. Um, and I'd urge anyone who is involved um, with construction products, whether they're, they're manufacturer or use, um, to read it because it is a, a very important report. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic point. And, and I think one of the things I'm not sure we've mentioned in too much detail because it's understandably and undoubtedly a, a, almost a webinar in its own right, but it's the, the topic of designated standards and, and the post Brexit move away from EU harmonised standards to now transposing those as a way of presumption of conformity for GB law. I think for construction products, it's about 440. And again, there is likely, I mean, that's the list at the moment as it stands. But of course, you know, we don't quite know how, from a regulatory point of view, that's likely to develop yeah. too. So we support government with that also. 
just the point. Exactly. I think we're, 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 yet, we're yet to see how that will play out because at the moment it, it's, they've just taken all of the existing harmonized standards and made them into designated standards. I think there might possibly be one, maybe in another sector like medical devices, where a, a standard yeah. has been designated but not yet harmonized. Um, yeah. But yeah, as you say, we're, we're working um, on supporting this however best we can, and we will we'll see in the next few years how it works in practice. Yeah. Fantastic. So, I mean, we do have many more questions. I could I could keep you here for another hour, but then you would probably hate me. So I won't do that. And everybody's got jobs to do as well. So perhaps um, just just thinking about uh, wrapping up, Anju, I, I think we have a I think we might have some information we can just display as I go into this this last bit. So that's that's pretty much everything from uh, the main content. Like I say, thanks again to Simon and Cara for those pre that presentation, insightful content, and for you all again taking the time to listen to us through the tricky maze of information that relates to national and international standardisation. We genuinely hope this has given you the foundational knowledge um, to understand how and why standards are developed and by who. But there are further questions that you if there are further questions you have about the process or the topics that we, we, we cover or don't as the case may be please do feel to re, feel free to reach out uh, to any of us um, perhaps just to signpost some websites I think we touched on these our webinars um, forthcoming webinars and events can be seen at the bsi group.com slash events page Simon and Cara mentioned the standards development portal a lot. We definitely uh, encourage you to go to that site and register so that you can start to see things. We've got the link there to applying to be a committee member. I think the, the next one, I think there's a couple in June to signpost to you. My colleague Claire Price is delivering a session. I think it's 6th of June at 12 p.m. Modern methods of construction, off-site construction of residential buildings. Obviously, another very topical uh, points to, to cover there and then an interesting session in partnership with the um, Institution of Fire Engineers on the 27th of June covering fire safety requirements and the role of fire en engineer through the gateways. Um, as always you can sign up for these and others of interest on the events page of the website there's an on-demand section too but unfortunately that is it from all of us. Thank you once again and um, we hope to see you again at one of our events again in the future. Thank you and goodbye. I know, thank you.